I got started in environmental engineering uh, largely because of my upbringing. My family owned golf courses and my father uh, would actively use fertilizers and pesticides to make the grass beautiful and I believed that this couldn't be good for the environment and so from a young age I wanted to be uh, involved in working with something related to the environment and natural resources and then when I was in high school I started to look at options for doing that kind of work in college and I originally started looking in natural resources and science areas and then I uh, was introduced to the idea of thinking of it from an engineering point of view and so I looked for environment and engineering and I found environmental engineering in the Peterson Guide. And from that point on I looked at programs that had environmental engineering in their undergraduate curriculum and that's how I ended up at the University of Illinois. So at the University of Illinois, I was an undergraduate co-op student, and I uh, attribute that to keeping me in environmental engineering. I was a co-op for um, a surface coal mining operation where I uh, was allowed to do environmental monitoring, and I got to drive a four-wheel drive truck every day, um, and I loved the job. And then uh, when that co-op program uh, ended, I moved to um, the Navy. I worked for the Navy in southern Indiana and again was environmental monitoring and I got to drive a truck and uh, I was allowed to really see how environmental monitoring um, associated with past practices. I was at ground zero of Superfund within the Navy when we were digging some of the first wells to identify uh, where the mustard gas site was and where the um, dry cleaning solvents were and, and starting to identify uh, what all ended up being super fun sites. Uh, so that was my undergraduate and I loved it. I stayed for my master's um, and then I decided I needed some practical experience. And so I moved to Texas and I worked for Sage Tomb Hill for three years. But I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to be, uh, uh, probably be a professor. I, I wasn't sure about that in practice because I love the practice side as well, but I wanted to get my PhD. And that's when I went to Clemson University, uh, specifically to work with Les Grady, um, and finished my PhD there, uh, at, after which I was hired uh, at the, uh, Virginia Tech as an assistant professor, uh, where I was for 14 years. Um, the University of Michigan recruited me to be uh, in the administration and as a department chair. And uh, that was a tough decision to move, uh, but I had family up in that area, and I uh, had opportunities to collaborate more in the public health arena at the University of Michigan. And so a number of things led to my moving to Michigan. And now I am um, a professor who teaches and does research and uh, happily uh, advising students. So uh, having children being a professor and how, uh, how we manage that. Actually, um, so within environmental biotechnology at Michigan, uh, there are three female PIs, and then we recently added uh, Glenn Diger, a professor of engineering practice. And amongst the three female PIs, we have, I think, seven children. Um, and, and we're very visible with that. I think it's important for our students to see us managing our family lives and our professional lives. And I use technology to uh, you know, make sure that I'm effectively connecting and communicating and, uh, with my students so that it's not, um, you know, so, so that I, I can try to do both jobs. You know, it's, it's, it, is, it is two jobs. Um, and being a parent is a, is a full-time job. Being a professor is a full-time job. They're both excellent jobs to have. Um, I don't consider them jobs, you know, they're, they're part of my life. Uh, so I think it's good for the students to see us managing it. I think the universities are becoming more progressive at being family friendly. Uh, Michigan is actually quite progressive at family friendly policies, although not perfect. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's doable. Um, so I hope, I want to be sure that the students see us you know, our kids come to work sometimes, sometimes they're in our classroom, sometimes they're, you know, whatever it takes to, to make it work. And our, our children then also know more about what we do. My kids know that I 
treat water and I make water safe for people around the world and from the countries they come from and they're happy about that so it's good for them as well to um, be integrated into uh, the work that I do um, so uh, I think we've come a long way we still have progress to make but um, uh, we have more women now in our program than we have men uh, so it's parity has been achieved <laughs> So my work, the work that I do today, uh, focuses in a couple of arenas. One, uh, it focuses on water technologies, and I uh, look at uh, new nutrient removal technologies and their effectiveness. I, I remain very uh, interested in the fate of, of xenobiotic chemicals through these systems, both in the wastewater and drinking water side. Certainly, uh, it's an area of concern. We take drugs as pills. and. Uh, the way that they're designed is that you take a much higher mass of concentration than your body needs. The vast majority of it is emitted as waste. And so we uh, basically pee out the vast majority of what we're taking. But when it comes to pharmaceuticals, they are designed to be biologically active in your body at low levels. And so a low concentration of a pharmaceutical is of, of greater concern from a ecotoxicological or for aquatic species or for human health than would uh, maybe some industrial chemical at the same level. You're saying that we, we, we believe they're in the water but we're not sure if they're there at a level that would pose a risk to whom human health is We know they're in the water because we can detect them. Um, but yes, the risk analysis associated with that I think is certainly still being evaluated. So how do we know there are pharmaceutical drugs in the water? We use um, analytical chemistry instruments. We use chrom chromatography and mass spectrometry significantly to a degree where we can detect them very clearly and confidently uh, what is there and at what levels that they're there. I think the solution is upstream. I think changing drug delivery could be a huge help to reducing loads into the environment. They have technologies, patches, et cetera, that bring drugs into our body at much lower doses than a pill. What are you doing in your lab to address this issue? I study the pharmaceuticals on the wastewater side, which um, we view as the first step in drinking water treatment. Environments that have oxygen present but at very low levels, um, they uh, perform comparably in terms of pharmaceutical removal to environments where we provide a lot of oxygen. Putting oxygen into the wastewater treatment plant to enable treatment is half the cost of the treatment plant and it's the vast majority of the carbon footprint. So if we can reduce the energy input and the carbon footprint at the treatment plant and at the same time get the same level of pharmaceutical removal that's better than a treatment plant that just puts all that oxygen in, let's go for it. So that's what we're looking at. I want to do what I can to get it out before it enters into the environment so that it doesn't end up at the drinking water plant. After my last sabbatical, I've started to look at urban water infrastructure models at the urban shed scale and trying to use those models to help us um, understand the implications of decisions such as implementation of green infrastructure and its benefit or impact on centralized treatment systems or resource recovery systems. So trying to use the models to address um, how our cities are changing and how our cities can become more sustainable. It's a really exciting time for environmental engineering, especially in a global context. You know, what's exciting to me, I, I'm teaching freshmen right now, and these uh, students are so enthusiastic about uh, the impact they can have across the world. And they want to be uh, active and effective in that way, but they, they don't want to just go do a project. They want to be sure that what they do has sustainability to it. It's long-term impact. Um, and so I find that it's a good time for us as a discipline. My specific interests are in really growing the environmental engineering professoriate across the globe. I, if I, the work I do in Africa and Ethiopia specifically, um, I find it interesting how um, hard these faculty work. If you look at the number of faculty in, in African universities who have PhDs, it's, it's less than 20 percent. Um, the number of students entering into universities are increasing substantially as many of the countries in Africa are, um, you know, 
being able to support and grow their universities, but they don't have the faculty in place to move from uh, undergraduate education to graduate education. So, so we're growing the professoriate in both directions. Uh, uh, you know, our domestic students learning to be partnered with uh, people from around the world and uh, the students from other countries having partners in the United States. And I can look 10, 20 years out and think about what those partnerships will be. And I think it'll be, it'll really help, I think, amplify our global existence as a profession. So um, I would love to see that to be a model that AWSP actually um, implements uh, and would love to be part of that. Global competency is very important in any of this, uh, these global initiatives and I know that within our universities we um, are implementing global competency programs before students travel or before they get engaged in this work. Um, does AWSP get involved? I think that there could be a role for AWSP, certainly even at the biannual conference, thinking about um, maybe uh, having some activities associated with um, that kind of training uh, bef to really uh, make sure that we are putting our best foot forward as a, as a profession um, and that we're doing the right work for the right reasons in the right way. Uh, because we can really do a lot of damage if we don't uh, don't have um, that competency training in place and, and with the students and the faculty. So um, in, in my in my group, we have a number of uh, visitors from different countries. Right now, I have uh, three visitors from Ethiopia, from Addis Ababa University. Um, and I partner a PhD student at AAU with a PhD student in Michigan, and they collaborate as students, and so they become peer uh, peers in the process of providing access to instrumentation on our side and access to context and, and, and case study sites for my student on the other side, um, hopefully co-authoring papers. So, I think this is repeated across many universities within the AWSP community, um, but we don't tend to share that information. And so I think AWSP's role could be in both building the global competency of the AWSP community, but also helping to identify effective models that um, allow us to have long-term relationships with these international partners um, I would love to see AWSP almost be a portal for making some of those connections and um, you know, core faculty who have experience in doing this kind of work effectively, being part of the competency you know, training or building our competency as a profession. I, there's just so much need and so much interest and, and if we all do it individually, I think we'll put more energy into the effort than if we started to collaborate a bit more. So I hope that we can find a way to do that and maybe AWSP could help facilitate that coordination. I think that would be great.